I'm Derek Smith. I'm the founder of Plug In South LA. I am here to kick off the Uncovering New Opportunities in Venture Capital uh, session. We have a, a, an awesome a cohort of panelists here to talk about, you know, all of the really sort of cool things that we need to know about venture capital as a career uh, destination and, you know, just as a space that is, you know, intricately linked to, you know, entrepreneurship and funding and supporting the growth of some of America's most innovative companies in the future. Um, so on the panel, we have Austin Clements, co-founder and partner at Slauson and Company, Lydia Medina, an investor at Vamos Ventures, Rami Reyes, co-founder and managing director at Next Equity Partners and president of Latinx VC, Sydney Sykes, co-founder and CEO, co-CEO of Black VC. Um, I would like to ask each of you to um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you sort of, you know, landed into this venture capital space and then um we can dive a little deeper into i think all of the questions that we want to unpack and, and 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 address in this session because there's a lot to talk about so um ladies first let me go for it <laughs> lovely uh great to meet all of you virtually um i'm city sykes i'm one of the co-founders of black bc which is a nonprofit focused on increasing diversity in venture capital and increasing specifically black representation. Uh, I began my career in venture uh, at a firm called NEA doing mostly early consumer investing since then, but continue to co-lead this nonprofit as well as to now do angel and scout investing. So mostly pre-seed, seed consumer investing. Uh, excited to be here with all of you today talking a bit about something that's really essential to my nonprofit. I'm Lydia. I'm an investor at uh, Vamos Ventures. Prior to that, was at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative on the venture investing team, where we focus on ed tech, uh, future of work, financial inclusion at the um, outer edges. And then uh, prior to that, pretty typical investment banking background. I was at JP Morgan doing TMT um, right out of college. That's great. Rami? Hi, my name is Rami Reyes. I was uh, born and raised in Miami, ended up going to uh, getting a scholarship to go to Penn out of high school uh, and then got a job straight out of college at a big venture fund called Elevation Partners. Uh, after spending five years there, uh, I started a new fund called Next Equity Partners, focused on mid-stage venture companies back in 18. Um, and then in my spare time, I co-founded Latinx Next organization helping more Latinos and Latinas into venture, uh, the ranks of venture. Thanks for that, Rami. Um, a couple of uh, quick questions to start us off. Um, Can I give my one, <laughs> Austin, sorry. <laughs> no, I was, uh, uh, we, we, could, we could jump into it. I'll just do a very quick intro. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Austin Clements. Uh, I'm with Slauson and Company. We're an early stage venture firm. Uh, I started my career, born and raised in LA. Uh, I started my career in um, in venture with a firm called 1110 Ventures, which is another seed stage fund based here uh, in LA. Uh, and uh, actually had a few internships, and, uh, things like that, in business school and other other ways to try to break into the industry. And uh, happy to uh, progress to now running uh, my own firm now. So, yep. Pass it back to you, Derek. Thank you, and 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 sorry for being so zealous. I mean, you and I know each other, so but it's important that some of the folks in the community know who you are, um, and the, the cool things that you're doing. Um, so, two quick questions that I'd like to throw out to you guys is: Can can someone break down what is venture capital, and also break down how do you sort of get into it? Um, I think we, we, we just lost Austin, but maybe he'll be back in a second. Um, do you guys want to tag team that? Who wants to go first in terms of uh, defining what is venture capital and, and really what does it represent in you know, sort of the investment space for entrepreneurs and um, you know, other types of investors that want to you know, sort of uh, put their money to work for them? I'm happy to kick that off. Um, 
venture capital at its core is private investing. It's putting capital raised by multiple stakeholders into a fund and then investing. You know, so the general partner of that fund invests it into different private companies to help them grow. Um, that is also the description of private equity. So the difference between venture capital and private equity is really that venture capital is focused on younger, earlier, um, and more risky businesses. So for example, you know, Uber is a startup that was invested in by venture capitalists, but then as it grew, was invented, invested in by growth equity and, and private, uh, private equity companies. So happy to have anyone here augment anything I left out. Yeah, I would just add that uh, venture capital is a very specific type of finance instrument. So really, um, it's basically like timing and like the why now piece is really important. So venture capital is really um, intended for companies that are on to something very timely, something big um, that they could benefit a lot from, you know, a very expensive uh, uh, fi financing instrument. And so that's why growth is really, you know, the biggest, you know, indicator or uh, investment driver. There are other things based on like, thematic, you know, investing thesis and things like that. But at its core, it's a really specific type of venture of, of like financing intended to uh, really just kind of grow um, a company. Otherwise, if the growth potential isn't there in a very like, you know, five to 10 year frame, it's probably not, you know, the best for the entrepreneur or, or the business to give up, you know, that much equity and uh, to kind of funnel something that is not really going to make, you know, it makes sense for investors and, and the company. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that was really important. But you just say that the the last part of that again, you know, about the growth, you know. Sort yeah, of yeah, totally. So the growth. So when you're uh, thinking about like different ways to to fund, um, you know, a business, your your business, um, equity is just you have equity and debt. Equity is just really expensive um, on the owner um, or the or, or the founder. So you're basically making a trade off that like that that equity that you're willing to sell off is is fine, it's worth it because that, you know, it'll make your company grow that much more. And so at the end of it, the, the gains from, from like an investor side and from an, an entrepreneur side, it makes sense to, you know, kind of give that equity up front. Um, but if you don't have those growth profiles, so if it's just like, you know, the business model is not scalable, other um, nuances with the business model, it's probably not in your best, in the founder's best interest to raise really expensive capital because you could just do the same thing with debt, which is a lot cheaper. And so I think, that specific piece is like really important, um, especially at the early stage. Um, so where Vamos, for example, is, is investing in. And, and I think it's helpful for entrepreneurs too to kind of go through that calculus. Um, I've seen it a lot of times where it's like, you know, they're raising their uh, companies are raising a seed round and they've already given up 40 percent because, you know, a very um, opportunistic uh, investing in investors uh, who you know, obviously they're investors and they have their their own incentives. But I think um, especially for, you know, Latinx founders, I think that's a really important sort of thing to always keep, keep an eye out um, and just making sure that it makes sense for where you are in, in, in terms of your, you know, stage and your trajectory and then who, who your partners are and if they are the right partners for now. Thank you. Rami, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? No, I think I think they cover it pretty well. Um, do you, how about how about sort of teeing us up for you know breaking into venture capital? What 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 you know, if, if you're how do you how do you get into venture capital? What what is sort of the roadmap? Is there a clearly cut defined path that you have to take to you know, you know become a controller of the purse strings in terms of who gets investment dollars, or um, is it wide and open in terms of the different ways that you can sort of plug in as a an investor into the venture capital space? So, so I think it varies a little depending on the stage you focus on. So uh, my other three fellow panelists are all early stage investors. I'm more of a mid-stage investor. There's a little more of a quote unquote typical profile at our stage, which is a lot of times folks tend to come from like investment banking backgrounds or have um, operational backgrounds with, with finance, a lot of finance experience, because as you get later stage, the numbers matter a lot more. Um, and so you have to be more on the financially savvy side. Uh, and so you typically see people go to two years investment banking um, and maybe go straight at the junior level to a firm. Um, but you'll also, you know, they could come from consulting. They could have worked on the operating side and had some financial experience. Um, so there is some variation where you see a lot more variation is at the early stage. And you can kind of have a wide range of experience. And every firm has a different profile of what they like to hire for. 
Um, so some firms might like people who are engineers, some firms like people who started their own companies, some firms might like still like someone who's financially savvy. Um, so it, it really, or someone who's really, and so that's one of the cool things about venture that people were always like, Hey, I don't know if I fit into venture. Reality is it hungry can fit in if they find the right badge. You kind of That's great. Thank you. Austin, Sydney. I mean, I, I, I think I covered it so well, a lot of, a lot of what you said. There are so many firms, uh, to put in perspective, you know, over the last year in 2020, there were about a thousand or maybe over a thousand new venture firms being started. And, um, and so there, there are these lots of companies and lots of firms that are out raising capital uh, from limited partners, which we could talk about in, in a little bit for context. But basically, a venture capital firm is a, is a financial institution created to manage the money of other people, investing specifically in the asset class uh, that, uh, that Sydney and Lydia described earlier. Um, so, I, you know, but, but what happens is when you have a thousand different firms, um, new firms coming into play, people want have to find ways to differentiate themselves. How am I different than uh, the next investor? Uh, how's my strategy different? Everything like that. And so, as a result of that, when people find their point of differentiation, it might be a unique perspective, uh, which we call an investment thesis. Like, what is your what is your investment thesis? Where are you approaching? Where are you looking for opportunities that lead you to believe that you're going to outperform the other 999 raising capital? And as a result of so many varying theses, you can recognize that there are so many varying roles that will be there to support. Uh, to Rami's point, um, you know, if, if my if my thesis is like I really want to dig into founders that you know uh, that that come from say underrepresented backgrounds and, or or immigrant founders, for example, there there would be a new fund like that, and that's because I believe that immigrants, you know, have a, a stronger sense of will, a stronger drive and motivation and hunger to succeed. And so if I, if I bet on all these immigrants, then that'll be great. So if I'm, gonna, if I'm now a partner that's starting a firm based on this and I want to hire an associate, then I will, you know, at, probably want to hire an immigrant, but at, at, at least want to hire somebody. Part of my criteria for who I'm looking for is somebody who has familiarity and understanding of the nuances of that particular demographic. And so that's, those are all these other tangible skills that are unique to that venture firm based on their investment thesis. And so as you look to learn more uh, different funds and what they're about and what they stand for, um, as you find that what they're investing in is aligned with your beliefs, it's probably a good reflection that you're actually uh, might be a great candidate for them uh, to hire. You. Yeah, that's a really good point. Just to add on to that, I think, um... The, the reason why a lot of, especially on the early stage, because there aren't and there aren't a ton of numbers like projections are even in within the year are pretty, you know, question marks. Um, so I think having like a product background or an ops background, you're able to kind of get ask specific questions that you can take from your own experience working at, you know, as a product person, engineer or ops person and really like in a nuanced way, understand sort of how to kind of get to, you know, whether a company is good or bad a good investment or a bad investment and it's all it's really qualitative um especially at the pre-seed and seed stage so you can really spin your um experience and more often than not um it'll probably be like understanding how to craft you know their story your experience and why it would be suited for um a venture firm that you're applying to i i totally agree with what everyone said i think um, especially the points about differentiation being crucial today when there are so many venture capital firms. I, I would strongly stress that. I think the one other thing that's really crucial to venture that comes so naturally to so many of us is just having the network. Um, the network for many venture capitals is just the way they get deals, it's the way they hire, it's the way they bring in LPs and raise more money. So if you're trying to break into venture, um, building up that network with entrepreneurs, building up that network with um, experts in certain areas and VCs is hugely important. And of course, that's that's gonna be a slog and a hustle sometimes. But the nice thing about networks is that they breed themselves and the more people you know and the better uh, relationships you have, the stronger and more new relationships you have as well. So 
that's the only other thing I'll add is it's some aspect of different differentiation expertise and some aspect of network and um, and social social aspect. I just want to comment on that because I completely agree with Sydney. I think, you know, I remember growing up, they would tell me your network is your net worth. Uh, it's really true in venture. And but I would tell people, be patient. It takes a long time to build relationships. Um, a couple pieces of advice. First, when I first came in the industry, you know, I didn't know anybody. Um, my thing was meet as many when I was at an event. And I realized that that wasn't very effective because I met a lot of people very quickly, but I built no relationships. Uh, and so as I got you know more experience, what I did is any event I went to, my goal was to make one good connection. If I met one person that I'm like, I'm going to stay in touch with that person, that was a very successful networking event. And so I'd encourage people try to build meaningful relationships and and wait because they'll take time to develop and it'll take time for your network to kind of grow. You know, I started hustling, building my network right out of college. You know, I didn't source my first huge deal till about seven years into my career. And then I sourced a bunch of huge, big, successful deals. And so it took a while. I felt like, man, I, am I, ever, I feel like I'm good at networking, but like I don't see the fruits. I'm like, how can I compare to these super experienced people who, who have it? But uh, you know, are doing all these things, but it kind of builds on itself uh, quietly over time. So, um, Rami and Sydney, you both um, have founded organizations that are focused on bringing in, you know, identifying and cultivating more um, diverse talent in the venture capital space, right? Um, you know, when, when, when I, Rami, when I hear you talk about um, what it what what is required to sort of break into even a mid level or you know later later um, stage venture capital firm or in and or even earlier stage it, it's it all sounds like very democratic right go work at the right company and you know then you can sort of just like pick up the phone call somebody or you know yeah you know, send your resume over and you get looked at and considered for some of these opportunities sounds very simple but like when we look at the picture of venture capital in this country it looks very sort of structured and what i mean by that is that we don't see we don't see the you know the, the faces of latinx vc and, and black vc in a lot of these sort of blue chip venture capital firms so um what what, what do you say to you know sort of young people who sort of hear this advice and they think oh it's really you know just cut and dry like I really need to network more and you know sort of go and work at Goldman for a couple of years and then you know my ticket you know is at Greycroft next or you know uh, Kleiner, uh, Kleiner and Perkins like can you guys just sort of like break down the nuance of this a little bit more and and sort of you know give your po point of view on like why don't we see more diversity in the venture capital space and what are some of the things that this next generation of talent can sort of do to break through and and i have to give a shout out to pledge la one of our partners who is you know sort of invested in this piece of the puzzle because i think we all recognize and that we can't we can't move this needle on venture dollars this three percent that we've been talking about for the past seven years or however long um you know we can't move it if we can't get more diverse talent into some of these sort of spaces or places where people have the ability to make decisions about where they put their dollars. Um, so the question is, what 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 do we tell young people or this next generation of, of venture capitalists? You know, what's the right thing that they need to do? You know, is it is it is it cut and dry, or do we really have to be honest and candid about how to really break through the the, the noise of um, you know the things that you have to do to get into the, these firms? Yeah, I have. So I went to Syracuse for undergrad and it was very and kind of like me breaking into investment banking out of a non target school, which basically means a non Ivy was incredibly difficult. And so like I didn't even know. So I grew up in, in Koreatown, really close to UCL, uh, USC. Um, so I didn't really know what even investment banking was, had it not been for a lot of my friends who kind of told me about it, like, hey, you'd be good at it. You should try. You have the grades. And I was like, OK, I'll try. And it was really difficult. And so Unfortunately, I, I think you're right. It's not, it sounds like democratic. It's really not. It's basically, I think it's a pipeline issue. So I think even just exposure to, you know, how like these avenues, right? Like consulting, investment banking, just, just making, you know, people aware, um, you know, uh, Latin, uh, Latinx people, black students, um, just really making them aware that, hey, these are avenues that you could pursue. I think it really does start there because it's pretty clear, like, you know, kind of once you kind of break into the, 
investment banking or consulting world, a lot of doors do open, especially for, you know, VC or private equity or other types of, you know, pretty, pretty um, like elite jobs. And so I think that the reality is that it's, it's, a, it's really a pipeline issue and we have to start kind of being a little more upfront and honest to address that issue. Because to your point, like if, if, if all you need is an Ivy League, that might, that's not really easy to attain. Um, and so I think just like uh, being really upfront that it's, it is a pipeline issue, um, I think will make, you know, will be the most uh, beneficial and we will start seeing a little bit more um, just improvements that kind of directly go to that root cause. Uh, to Lydia's point, I, I think it is so true that there's more awareness will always um, increase black representation starting at the early age. At the same time, I think is a huge flaw in venture capital that 80% of black investors came from Harvard or Stanford. Uh, that's definitely not the same hoops that I think white investors are jumping through. Um, I think, frankly, what what it comes down to and why venture capital is so homogenous is it's an industry built on relationships. And we've all said this time and time again, if you look back, especially at the early days in venture capital, you're starting a firm with your college roommate, getting money from, you know, your friend who started a startup that exited and you're investing in the, the person you live next to. That's, that's just because the industry has been so focused on gut instincts and relationships. But the truth is we've seen some incredible investors, some incredible entrepreneurs who have broken out in spite of not being from those target schools or that specific background. The talent is there. There is incredible black investor talent. There is incredible black entrepreneur talent. That is true for Latinx, um, underrepresented founders across a, a plethora of aspects. Um, but what venture capital has been trained for is this very specific person. And I think the most important thing we can do now is really repeat and instill the belief that venture capital is a stronger industry when it represents more investors, more ideas, more consumers. Um, it'll be bigger, better, stronger. So I think that that we just need to say that the business case time and time again is it's there for hiring more diverse founders, investors, um, and putting that money back into these communities that are really a huge of huge economic value yeah totally and i think like to that point um it's a little silly if we kind of look at like okay who are the creators or who are the founders that are you know revolutionizing the tech of the future they do not look like what the majority of the country is going to look like in you know the next 20 30 years so it's it would behoove investors and the vc ecosystem to get uh, folks who understand fundamental, you know, nuanced consumer behaviors and can actually make business models to supplement what will be, you know, a majority of the demographic, you know, in not that far from now. So I think um, there is definitely a business case for it. And I, and I totally agree. And so I think um, for anyone trying to break in, I think it's, it's more so now just given all, you know, the, the past year and Kind of the reckoning that not just the vc world but just you know as a whole we've kind of come to i think it, it is starting to you know it's obvious and at least people are talking about it which is very unseen i think everyone kind of you know they knew it was an undertone but no one was really talking about it so it's really it's really awesome to see you know we'll, we'll see if, if people will, will put their money where their mouth is but i think at least we're talking about it and i think that's a huge just path forward um than where we were like even a year ago so one com a couple of comments, because I, I know part of the question is also, so what do we do about this? Um, so first of all, I agree there's an awareness issue in, in complex. There's a lot of different things going on. Partly there's an awareness issue. I went to an Ivy League school and I didn't even know what venture capital was. Like I accidentally kind of fell into it. Um, and so and I agree. Uh, I, I keep it real. You know, half I went to work and half the kids were not that smart. Uh, and so there's a lot of really smart people uh, all at all the different universities and all across the country. And, you know, I got very fortunate that people assumed I was super smart uh, because I went to Wharton. Um, and most of the people uh, that went there, you know, came from very privileged backgrounds. And so, you know, I was fortunate as a, the son of a single mom to get a scholarship there, but that's very rare. Um, and so I think we're doing a disservice to the country by just focusing on certain schools, even though I benefited from that. So I completely agree with that point. I think the second thing is we need more pipeline also in some of the industries that that serve that end up funneling into venture capital. So for example, 
uh, black and Latin folks are very underrepresented in software engineering. And a lot of VCs come from software engineering backgrounds. We're heavily underrepresented in product management. A lot of VCs come from that background. And so I think part of the pipeline, it, part of it's like, let's help people realize VC is this cool career that works for some people. Two, let's get more people into some of the industries that drive into VC and investment banking is also in there. Um, though there have been some great organizations like SEO who've made uh, uh, some head roads there. Um, and then, you know, I also think it's part of the point that Sydney brought up, which is there's, uh, you know, traditionally people just hire the people they kind of know of. So what have we done about that? Well, both Black VC and Latinx VC have newsletters where we share jobs. Um, so historically, people just hit up their friends for jobs. Well, now that there's Black and Latin people in the industry, we can get together and send the jobs to other people. Um, and so we both have, or both of our organizations have newsletters. Um, and then there's also, you know, uh, awareness and education. And we both have uh, programs that we've launched uh, to help educate folks who are really talented uh, to get into these industries. You know, we launched a fellowship program a month ago. We had hundreds of, app hundreds of applications. And a lot of people that applied are way more qualified than a lot of the people at a lot of these venture firms. And so there was the talent out there and there is the talent out there. Um, but we know we have to create more opportunities for folks. Yeah. I, I will just lastly say I, that last point is really critical. Um, there is so much talent out there. There are so many incredible black and Latinx investors that sure, yes, we should definitely be increasing that act, that access and that representation. But if a, if a black or sorry, if a, a top 10 VC firm wants to hire a black and Latinx investor right now, they could and they would be one of the best investors. They could find someone. Um, so I think at the same time, while we're educating top talent, we also need to be educating these VC firms about what it means to have a, a really great investing staff and what that looks like. Because uh, I think we're all saying that the way it's looked in the past has not uh, is not how it will look in the future. And these firms need to start getting ahead of that. I don't, this is all great stuff. And thank, thank you all for just sort of like elaborating on this a bit more. Austin, did you have something that you wanted to say? Well, that, okay. uh, I don't want to if you want to move on. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I, I think that so much of it depends on you know, relationships has been said multiple times. Uh, venture capital, like you got to remember, most venture capital businesses are small businesses, and like most small businesses, you know, you're, you're, there's not uh, just like hiring of pools of talent or, or having classes, intake classes, or whatever. It's like it's like they kind of ask around. They they figure out who they know or who knows them, who can vouch for them. And things like that again very relationship driven um historically as sitting pointed out like these 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 groups were very very um you know insular and 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 located in one location and represented one demographic and now as we see more and more firms enter even if those dynamics are in place where people or this is very relationship based the point is there are venture capitalists that have access to different networks and thus uh, more people have access to them and they can put their cultural lens and cultural understanding. Like, you know, for me, I went to Morehouse for undergrad. Like, I wouldn't expect that most VCs that 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 graduated from Harvard or Stanford or whatever um, would, would, would have a strong opinion about Morehouse or Spelman or Howard or anything like that. Um, and like you, Derek, Morehouse as well, like, like, you know, we, we know that if you meet somebody that went to Morehouse, like that, that means something to you. You have the context around that that those people may not have. And as a result of that, like you could feel comfortable with saying like, okay, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is somebody who I know, who I understand, who, 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 who has, you know, ambition and, and we have mutual connections and things like that. And so all those same dynamics could be in place around being hired for a small business that a venture capital firm. But now we have access to new networks. I got to give a shout out to uh, like two of the people that I work with, um, Brittany Crockett, um, excuse me, and uh, and Chris McKenzie. So Chris went to Spelman, for example. Um, she's she's our associate, and um, and she's a member of, of Black BC. So Sydney knows her as well. But like 
again, very small circles and, and she knows people and I know people that know her and things like that. And so she, she ended up with a role with our firm. Um, and, and it's exciting to see that, that those similar dynamics to what locked us out in historical times and now, you know, creating entry paths for people that, you know, weren't from the industry and now we're able to, to create pathways for them to thrive. Thanks for that. Um, but what I was going to say, Austin, um, was, you know, I, I appreciate everything that each of you said on that point. And I, I really want to be sort of prescriptive too, uh, because it'd be a wasted opportunity with you guys on this, you know, in, in this session, not to sort of like give folks who are really trying to break in here, break into this space, some like actionable steps. And so, you know, Rami and Sydney, like talk about the programs that you guys have, like what, you know, what's the profile of the person that you guys are looking to sort of bring into your programs and what's the metric for success for those people coming out of these programs? Like what, what, what is their background? What should their background look like? What, you know, what type of work experience should they have? Um, you know, where are you placing them? Um, what is the goal of that placement? Talk about, and then, and then also unpack some of these other opportunities that exist in this venture capital space. We really talk about venture capital as this, thing or this person that just write checks, but there, 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 there are different sort of dimensions to, you know, what you can do. And if you guys can sort of shed light on that, I think it'd be really helpful to the community and the people that are listening. I'll say very quickly, and I would leave it to the people that run the, the organizations that are, that are, that are making a lot of this change. But to the second part of the question, I would agree there's, there's other roles that are in venture capital as far as just investing, as I mentioned. Um, Brittany Crawford, who's our head of platform, I believe she's in this chat listening to this right now, uh, you know, has done a phenomenal job of jumping on board with, with uh, no prior venture capital experience, but is helping us run a lot of operations. She's helping us manage the relationships that we have with our, our, our the investors in our fund, our limited partners. Um, we just top off a call with a very high profile limited partner. Um, who, you know, and she's, she's helping facilitate introductions between portfolio companies and that person. Um, she has about marketing and, and basically so many different aspects of our firm. Um, as with any small business, like everybody wears a hundred different hats. Um, but I think a lot of positioning yourself for roles, like play to your, play to your strengths and play to your skill sets. And like, you've got to know that you're coming into an entrepreneurial environment all together and, um, and 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 that you know it's not it's not as it's not as, as structured as say a larger organization and and as a result of that people want to you know uh, bring people onto the team that are go-getters that are hungry to, to make something happen and take a lot of initiative but i'll pass it to the two people that run organizations that are structured for this exact purpose <laughs> well one point i'll say is there's a typical you discussed earlier there's a lot of different strategies a lot of different firms want different things especially at the early stage and so you know, we just launched our fellowship um right like a month ago uh, the fellowship starts this week we selected 22 uh, applicants out of about 400 and they had very diverse backgrounds some people worked at startups some people had experience at bigger tech companies um we actually try to skew a little bit less the investment banking route because candidly you could get investment banking uh, you can get a job in at some venture firms out of investment banking anyways. Um, and so I think that goes to the point. The key is just get experience and show you're really passionate. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's what we're doing in the curriculum. So we're going to be doing that at least once a year, if not twice a year. Um, and so I encourage Latino professionals, uh, go to latinxvcs.com. Uh, um, you, can, you can sign up for more information. We'll also be launching a mentorship program to help those in the industry because the goal is not just get people in, but make sure people stay and kind of climb in their careers. Um, and then we also um, we also share jobs, as I talked about before, because people need to just know about the jobs. A lot of you are qualified uh, for these positions, and you might find a firm that, and even if most of the positions are you're not a fit for, there might be a firm that's looking for someone like you. And so just following what jobs are available um, is is good, and we you know. On our website, you can sign up for our, our job newsletter and also for our newsletter. Uh, and, and so those are some of the things we're doing today. Um, and then, you know, we'll be announcing a lot more stuff shortly. I'll, talk, I'll start with a general overview of uh, 
the skills that, you know, adding on to what Rami mentioned, um, there are two or three really important things. The first is being able to tell your story in a way that relates to venture. So the most important skill there, I think, is really showing how you learn from experiences and you're able to adapt them to new experiences. That's what venture capitalists are constantly doing. They're looking at companies they invested in the past and saying, how does this impact my decision to invest in a company in the future? What did that teach me? So showing that. The second thing is showing you're really knowledgeable, like Rami said, about certain spaces, especially if you can differentiate yourself through being an expert on a certain space and knowing those companies or the people in that company or the, the right, not the right, but a thesis on where that industry is going. That's another, I think, really important element to just breaking in once you're in the door. In terms of our programming, we have a few different ones. The, the one group is focused on our Black Venture Institute program, which is focused on executives, our Breaking into Venture program, which is focused on people who are junior in their careers. And then the last one is the PATH program, which is focused on people in New York and, and largely focused on um, bankers and consultants looking to make that transition. Those programs, like Remy said, are bringing in incredibly talented people who just need that look push. So we're talking to them about how to think about a cap table, how to think about building your brand, how to think about sourcing, and, and how to tr translate all of that into an interview. Um, but again, these people are really smart. So a lot of it's just about the connections, bringing in mentors, bringing in um, allies and, and uh, you know big firms throughout the industry so that they can jump in with that warm intro and really get the job. Another program we just launched applications for is uh, called the Black BC Scout Network. Scouts are individuals who are given money to invest in on behalf of a firm. Uh, this helps a firm expand their pipeline, brings in new expertise. It's great for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, and scouts are generally entrepreneurs or angels or experts, and they're deploying this capital and also getting a lot of experience in building a track record investing. Uh, we think scouting is a great way to increase the number of black check writers in the industry. So we're focused on making black scouts just one of the most incredible groups to be a part of. And if your firm doesn't have a black scout, you are missing deals, you're missing opportunities, you're not getting the next generation of best investors, period. So that's a, a bit of a new direction for us because now we really want to focus on supporting these existing investors and making sure they're, they have all the tools they need to succeed. Um, so there's a lot of different angles to breaking into venture. There's a lot of different angles to succeeding in venture. But at the end of the day, it's about learning how to invest, learning how to support companies and getting the relationships you need to uh, to make it into the industry and succeed. One, one thing that uh, Sydney prompted for me is, you know, I think most of the audience is folks a little younger in their career. Uh, you don't have to get into venture right away. Um, you can get into venture later in your career as well. Um, so I want to shout out a few orgs that help you get into certain careers that could potentially help you get into venture later. Um, so for example, SEO is very helpful if you're a college student getting into investment banking. I actually did SEO. I've been very involved with the organization for many years. There's also an organization called MLT that helps a lot with business careers at a, at, when you're in college. Um, and if you're applying to MBAs, MLT also has an MBA program and SEO has a program for people going into more like private equity, which can also potentially get you into mid to later stage venture later on. Um, there's also other careers. Uh, so software engineering, a lot of people want technical talent. There's not enough black and Latino uh, folks in software engineering. And what's going on now is a lot of companies are doing apprenticeship programs where maybe you teach yourself to code on the side or maybe you do one of these uh, small programs that uh, you learn to code and then you get an apprenticeship at a big tech company uh, and then you become a software engineer there and kind of climb the ladder. My wife actually was the only software engineer at Pinterest, I was Latina. She taught herself to code after college. Uh, she was an economics major, taught herself to code, got a job as a software engineer, and now she's you know big, climbed the ladder and has been at Pinterest for six years. Um, software engineering is a great uh, route for potentially for venture as well. And there's programs are in, in the product space, customer success, a lot of different spaces. So look, you know, if you're interested in tech more broadly, you don't have to go into venture right away. You just do something interesting, gain experience. Focus on learning and later you, you can focus on earning. Um, but, you know, you, you want to just learn as much as you can early on so that later in your career, you'll have a lot of options. And if you're really good at something, you'll have an opportunity to get into venture. The one other thing I'll mention is track record, super important. I love the scout program idea. Scout programs are one of the ways to build a track record. 
Um, another way is just do deals. Like if in your spare time you want to put a little bit of money in a couple startups, that's great. The reality is at the early stage, if you can be helpful for a start to a startup, they're going to let you in. Um, and if you're helpful to entrepreneurs, that helps you build your reputation. And so I highly encourage people if they can. Um, obviously, not everyone has the money to, but try to build a you know a startup track record early on. Some people will just do work for equity. You don't have to have money all the time. You can try to be creative. Um, but track record is the name of the game in this industry, and it takes a long time to build. Um, and so if you build a good track record, that's a very de defensible moat for your personal brand longer term. Yeah, and even scrappier than that, I would suggest like if you don't have money to angel invest, if you're in college, just honestly get a medium blog for free and start just writing out like, hey, I you know believe this it, this trend in fintech is going to be successful because of X Y Z. Document a bunch of stuff like pick like in theory if you had like a million dollars, what were what would be like the top five fintechs that you would invest in and why? And just like that exercise of just reading literally everything that you know the top uh, the top funds are kind of you know developing their investment thesis on or just like the way they think about the world i think is honestly just really important and i saw a question pop up as to like uh, you're just starting at, at bc at the associate level i think that's that's the same like it's really just like a learning thing and i think the apprenticeship aspect of bc is actually really important i think it's all about just like doing, you can't get better at VCs, especially if you aren't like actually like just doing it. And so I think just research, reading a lot would be, is a just a super helpful first step. So I'll put in, I think Bessemer Ventures does a really good job about documenting their like investment memos. They kind of go through it. They have a bunch of newsletters by topic that you can kind of like understand like, hey, what in the news or tech crunch should I be sort of reading upon? Or like, how are these companies or these VC funds kind of getting um, their ideas for investing thesis? And and Andreessen Horowitz has a really good, um, they just produce a bunch of content on like their investment strategy, you know, frameworks for thinking about, you know, different types of companies, business models and things like that. Um, so there's a ton of resources out there and it's just, they just like read, read, document everything. Um, even if no one's reading it on Medium, you can even put a link to that when you're applying to um, venture funds, especially if you kind of don't have that like banker consulting or, you know, PM in tech um, background, just kind of differenti differentiating yourself by like, you know, just showing that you genuinely love this stuff, I think is like, a it goes a, a really long way. Oh, and last plug for Vamos, we also have a scout program. Um, I We still have, we were trying to figure out the cadence of that. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, it, it's, a, it's a really great way. And I think every major, maybe every is the wrong word, but there's, a, for some reason, there's just a ton of capital that needs to be deployed. So um, everyone has like a, some version of a scout program. So that's a really great way to kind of break in and start building your track record as well. Well, we were... Derek, really quickly, well, well, you know, a few people have talked about different initiatives around breaking into venture. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one uh, from Pledge LA that's that's you know, been created that's now uh, in its third year, um, uh, which is the VC internship program uh, for, for Pledge LA. So the first year, it's done in conjunction with HBCU VC. Uh, which is another uh, nonprofit organization uh, that's that's designed to promote uh, paths of entry into the into the industry. Um, so they're, they're basically over the last two years they've put um, almost a few dozen um, students into top venture firms across the city of LA, and I think this year it went national, uh, where there are a few different cities involved, not just LA. Uh, but you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, to play a small role in, in, in helping put that together through Pledge LA and through HBCU VC, um, uh, where, 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 you know, I, I encourage people to check it out um, and, and apply. If you're a student, um, absolutely apply. This year it's closed, but uh, for next year, put it on your radar, sign up for the newsletter to make sure that uh, next time around you can find entry in, in entryway into the industry. But at this point, I feel like having put you know, a few dozen people into experience in the industry. That's a, that's a very good uh, opportunity worth acknowledging. One other quick thing I'll mention that was helpful to me early in my career is reading uh, public company financials, um, because a lot of being a good investor is knowing what makes a good business. Uh, and if you're if you're interested in certain industries, uh, there's no better way than to read how do the public companies in that industry work. Um, and so, you know, 10K is the annual filing that uh, that companies that are public file. I'd highly recommend just reading cover to cover 
the 10 Ks for a few companies. Once you get used to reading them, you can skip some of the boring sections. Like uh, you'll figure out which ones they are, but um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff you'll you'll learn from that. And I'd, I'd encourage folks to follow a couple businesses that they think are great businesses on the public markets um, because it'll help them form you know, how you think about investing longer term, even if it's early stage. Yeah, totally. And then even just like startups, like go on Crunchbase and like find a couple that are really a couple companies that you think are, you know, really interesting and then just add like Google alerts. So, you know, what's going on, you kind of can follow them and you can speak intelligently about them when you're um, pitching. Um, I think in, uh, one helpful thing for me was um, <clears throat> part of the interview process, regardless of, you know, if it's a scout program or whatever, there is going to be some form of like, all right, pitch a company that you think is helpful. And so if you're following, you know, a company really well, really closely, and you can speak to that, you know, company or trend or industry, I think that goes a long way. And then if you guys are still in college, you have a, an amazing resource in your professors, like find the one or two professors that are just like super into like, I don't know, whatever industry you're into, like ag tech or like something and just kind of get their academic perspective on it. And then you can incorporate that into your you know, investment thesis or just the way you think about an industry. I think that is a huge resource that I really miss. Um, professors love just, you know, chatting with students and helping them in any way and talking about passions. So I think like def definitely leverage that. I think it's a really interesting um, resource that is, you know, readily available and would be super helpful. So you, you, you make it into venture capital at the entry level and or mid-level. What does success look like? as a venture capitalist and how long does it take to be successful? Um, I think that there are generally two different paths that people take. Uh, as if, if you come in in an investment role at a junior level venture capital firm, um, the one, one path is I wanna become ultimately a partner at this firm or, uh, and another approach is I want to start my own firm. Um, and uh, I, I think that both of them are, are fine paths to take, and and um, and you know it it, it kind of depends on do you want to start a business uh, or, or bring something else, or do you want to build on top of the infrastructure that's already been put in place? And again, I think that that's more probably a life choice than anything. But when you think about like how long it takes, I think that. Um, you know, typically you, you say in maybe a, you know, I, 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 the way that you usually have, actually, um, Marlon Nichols wrote a really good article a couple of years back. I don't know how this just popped into my head, but like about the various roles and the responsibilities at a venture capital firm. So Marlon Nichols spoke earlier today. Um, uh, uh, he's a partner at Mac uh, Ventures. And uh, he talked about like just basically different roles and different responsibilities and what you take care of. Um, if somebody has that link handy, drop it in the chat for others. But um, but it's uh, I, I think that you know it could definitely take several years to get to like a partner level. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, so it could definitely take a, several years to get to a, like a partner level, but um, it all depends on like the deals you bring in, how much you understand the firm. Um, uh, which, whatever you want to do, and it probably takes just as long. To go and start your own firm as well, um, where people want to see a track record, people want to see all of those things. So I think that's probably the initial decision that maybe you actually don't have to make, like on day one. You the, the initially just do a great job at the firm you're with, but eventually you're going to probably go one way or the other. Well, you said several years. Does that mean you know three to five, five to ten? What what does that look like? Uh, depends on, uh, I guess it depends. Uh, so, so usually what happens is, is firms, uh, particularly smaller firms, with, with every new fund that they have, they might add or consider adding new partners uh, to the fund. The fund lasts 10 years, but usually you add a new fund every, well, these days it's like two and a half, two years, but like, but anywhere from two to five years, let's say, people create a new fund um, for their firm. So like our first fund is a $50 million fund. Our next fund might be whatever, some, something like that. And then at that point, we would sort of consider. So um, those are usually the points where, where, where general partners who run the fund start thinking about like who they want to add. 
as a as a partner. And depending on where you are in the trajectory, um, that's that's how it can fit in. So it sounds like headcount is tied to how many funds a venture capital firm might have open at any point in time. Uh, and that, that's where you're thinking about budget. You're thinking about planning. Is at the time of a new fund. You have to think about your funds and, and the ten-year life of how that fund is going to perform and who the people are that's going associated with that fund and what you need to have structure in place. When you add a second fund or third fund to it, you have more money under management, meaning you have a, over, a larger overall budget to manage the firm. And as a result, you sort of start making adjustments and planning based based on that. Um, so it's a, uh, it, it is a, I mean, for one, I guess it's worth noting, this is a long game. And if you're not thinking about it long term, you're, you're not going to stay in it. And, um, and so all of it is about like thinking in nearly in 10 year increments of like, of like, what do I want to accomplish over the next 10 years? More or less. So and a couple of comments there. Uh, so when you're early in your career, you're not what's called a check writer, which is someone who can make a decision to invest in a company. And so you're just trying to build all the skill sets um, and credibility to become a check writer uh, at a firm. And and then when you start becoming a check writer is when you really start building your track record. Um, and as was mentioned, it takes like 10 years to really know if you're a good investor, which is one of the crazy things about this industry. Uh, 10 years for the early stage, a little bit less for if you invest a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, that those are some of the things you need to consider when you go to a firm. I think if you go early in your career, you want to go where you can learn the most um, and where you'll have the most opportunity. And there's a lot of different dynamics at firms. There might be politics. There might be partners who are selfish and don't want to share. And there's not as much upside. Like um, there's a lot of things you need to figure out. Uh, I'm a big fan of diligence. You diligence investors, you should diligence a job. So go talk to people who used to work there. Forget the real experience, not like the fluffy, oh, kumbaya, everyone loves each other here, like truth. Um, figure out what if people had to do to be promoted? What are the things that are important? And and, and those criteria for success, um, while there'll be commonalities at different firms, the reality is different firms will value uh, different things. So for example, at my firm, we really value financial savvy. You know, we're trying, we're trying to be- trying to- financially savvy uh, mid-stage firms relative to other funds. Um, you know, I came from a private equity background as did one of my co-founders. Um, and so that's one of the things we care about. Um, but you know, other firms have different philosophies. And so I'd say figure out the criteria for success before you take a job, because you want to make sure the criteria for success is something you want to succeed at. If, if I could add very quickly, I, I, I don't want to make it seem like I was dodging your question about how long and stuff takes. So I, I, I maybe I'll talk about my own specific trajectory. I started at a venture firm. My first, I did a bunch of internships over a couple of years, worked with a few different firms. Um, my first full-time job was in 2015 with the firm 10110. Um, I was an associate. I joined as an associate. I was an associate for about a year and a half, maybe two years, uh, then became a senior associate. I was a senior associate for about a year and a half, two years, then became a principal. And then uh, I, as after a while I was a principal, that's when I started thinking about, hey, does it make sense to, to join this firm as a partner or does it make sense to do my own thing? I love the people that, that, that I worked with. I, you know, they mentored me and helped me and support me and cultivated my professional skill set. Um, but ultimately, for me, I decided that I wanted to build a firm based around my thesis and, and Slauson and Co's thesis, um, and and so decided to move down that path. So then, from there, after let's say a year and a half, maybe a year in, in principal role, I decided to move and start my own firm, and that was probably let's call it a, a year and a half, two year period to, to really getting the firm off the ground. So now I'm a general partner. At, at, a, at a venture firm. And so I started this journey full time in 2015. I officially became general partner at the top of this year. We're, we're very glad for that, uh, to see and watch the journey of this. Um, Rami, just going back to something that you said that, you know, in, in Austin, you can sort of, you know, uh, and Lydia, you, you all can sort of chime in here. Um, can you talk about these skill sets, like before you get to, you know, sort of the per before you get to become the person who writes the checks, 
what what's the credibility what that you have to sort of like build up and you know what 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 are the 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 soft and hard skills that you know sort of get you there um well one comment uh five years is not normal to becoming a partner it is a little faster if you start your own firm but it's a lot longer than that normally um so don't uh don't judge yourself by austin's experience uh <laughs> and, and, it, and the larger the firm the larger the longer it takes that's kind of the rule with the entire financial industry um and you know the more risk you take the more reward if it works out generally is the, the rule as well so starting a firm is pretty risky but if it works out it tends to work out better um, in terms of skills, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, more broadly. I, I think it'd be good for the early stage folks to, to chime in. But, um, you know, it depends on the firm. If, if, if a firm cares a lot about operations, um, you know, being able to have build good relationships with companies and, and help out the companies in your portfolio is important. Um, you know, within the deal set of making an investment, there's different sets. There's first showing that you know how to diligence a company. Um, th then there's learning like how do we issue the term sheet um, and you know you'll slowly get more responsibility in the process as you climb the ladder um, and then there's you know building out your network how strong is your network um, hopefully your network will grow over time you know, have you sourced any deals um, that might be important for some firms that's everything like they just care do you source deals um, for some firms it's less important it's usually somewhere in the middle and so you know there's there's a number of different criteria it at the end of the day, as I mentioned before, every firm's different. And so every firm's criteria will be different and every firm's role at a different stage is different. So as an example, at the mid stage, um, an associate, which is kind of the junior position at some firms, it's very financially heavy. You're building models, doing research at some firms. It's very cold calling and trying to score deals heavy. Um, and so you can have yeah. very different, different firms. I, I'd agree with that. I think for every firm, being a good associate comes ahead of being a good deal sourcer or being a good partner. Um, so I think that's about understanding cap tables. It's about knowing how to talk to founders and ask the right questions. It's about knowing how to do your, your diligence and your back end research and a bunch of other things. But the truth is, even though VCs are not great at training by any means, if you ask the questions, what does it take for me to succeed here? What does it take for me to support you as a partner in the best way possible? They will tell you what those skills are. Because like Rami's saying, they can differ a little bit. Me or is that Sydney? I think it's Sydney. Okay, so we can, we can, she'll probably be back because her Wi-Fi is buffering. Did anybody want to sort of just pick up I'll, where? I'll go real quick because she's you know she touched on a point around like vc is definitely an apprenticeship model where you're kind of following and you're learning people uh there there, there is no like training program there is no like structure particularly when you're talking about early stage funds and so a lot of times i i remember when i was first an associate and i would talk to all my other buddies that are associates like half the time you're asking them, like like i have no idea if I'm doing a good job or not, like you don't, you don't get a whole lot of feedback. There's way more autonomy than you would ever, ever get at your age and in a role. And, and, um, and, you, and it's, and it's, and it's difficult to know. Um, and so the, the, I guess my advice in that context is like, just, just try things, understand your partner, understand the firm, understand the, the goals and motivations, and then just start building and like, and, so in what I thought we talked about, here's an area that I started to work on and develop and and um, and and then seek feedback around that. And then and then from there, I think as you learn your skills, your unique skills, and maybe how you that's that's when you sort of part of your life. But it is it's an apprenticeship business, as my employees would tell you, I'm probably a much better mentor than I am a manager. Um, uh, and, and 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 as a result of that, I you know, I look to people pretty much as a flat organization um, where they could try to do whatever they want um, and, and, and I'm happy way. Yeah, for sure. I would echo that. Ask as much feedback as possible. I think, you know, they hired you for a reason. They like how you think. So I think all of that is table stakes, but I think it's really iterating and not being shy about like, hey, this is my thought process. This is what I think needs to happen. Am I going down the right path? Am I not? 
um, and just like really putting your ideas out there and really just kind of, you know, at the end of the day, what you're doing as a, an associate or even principal kind of start writing the checks is making a case for why it's a good investment. And so if you can start getting into the habit of kind of like, even with like, you know, my, this is my plan for diligence. These are the areas that I think even just like getting in the habit of understanding what sort of logic checks your uh, partner is uh, kind of going through, I think is really helpful and will obviously make you an, a better investor overall. Um, so yeah. Welcome back, Sydney. We were just picking up where you left off. So if you wanted to finish that thought about asking, you know, asking your partner, what are the requirements, um, you know, to be successful here um, and having them break it down, and, you know, you had some other sort of follow up points. It, it sounds like Lydia really took it off well from there. Uh, the one other thing I was going to add is that I think for the first year, you really don't need to be worrying about sourcing deals but you should be thinking about expanding your network, meeting other VCs, building up a brand for yourself. I'd say after year one, you should really start thinking about sourcing. Um, in the end, when you're a partner, when you're a venture capitalist in the long term, you're defined by your deals and your track record, uh, as well as your relationships and, and how helpful you are as a board member and things like that. But you, you need to start thinking about deals at some point and actively looking. But I would not say that you can let that get in the way of being a good analyst or associate and supporting your existing portfolio companies and partners. Also, just on that point, the venture world is very small. The brown and black venture world is even smaller. And so you really want to make sure that your reputation with founders especially is really solid because you want to be the VC that, you know, the when the a company was like a pre-seed or seed, you were the one that, you know, made a connection that kind of really changed the trajectory or something even smaller than that. And then they go to you and make space for your firm or and things like that. That's really where the relationships um, start and the reputation, like firm's reputation, like gets out very quickly. Like, yeah. So <laughs> that being said, just always keep that in mind. You know, the founders are, are your customers if you want to look at it that way. Um, you know, so that's another uh, important thing to, to highlight as well. Are there any questions that you, you, folks in the chat have that you want to you know throw out before we wrap up and get out of here? I mean, we've just been addressing them as you guys have been posting them, but you know, anyone else have anything that they want to ask that we didn't get a chance to cover? Um, well, you know, really appreciate you all being here. Is there anything that you all want to leave with? the audience in terms of you know breaking into venture capital and, and and or tapping into new opportunities here sign up for latinx vcs newsletter sign up for black vcs newsletter pledge la's newsletter uh here in la um and uh so many so many so many good resources out there so be proactive about finding. Um, and just, just you know, on that note, I, I know we all want to get out of here, but the, and don't roll your eyes when I ask this question, please. But like, how soon do you think we can move this needle? This, you know, to, to you know, this, this tiny percent of dollars, you know, sort of flowing into black and brown, you know, sort of companies through the lens of venture capital, really behind the 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 ten x companies, the founders who are sort of developing the the future of tomorrow. Like what? what what how, how much longer like do you know do you guys have kind of like a vision for how quickly we can move the needle here and we can leave <laughs> silence I'd say that the needle is constantly moving forward we venture capital is one of the most homogenous and least diverse industries we're constantly making progress just by being here. So I would encourage everyone to keep hustling, keep working hard um, and to have a positive outtake, but also continue to strive to make change. I love that. Thank you for that. I, I just think virtual hug, virtual hug on that one. <laughs> Austin, Lydia. Yeah, I would just echo that. I think like um, there is a lot of great talent, both potential investors, potential founders, I think we just need to start communicating more and really consolidating that platform. And so, I mean, just, you know, after this, feel free, I'm, I'm an open book. You can, you know, 
uh, add me on LinkedIn or share out my contact info, how, whatever the most efficient way possible is. But the more we can start collaborating and really just kind of building that community and platform where we're all just kind of talking together um, and really just sharing ideas and things like that, I think that's that's one step. Um, so there are a lot of great resources out there and really great like deal sharing communities and things like that um, that I think are you know meaningfully changing. I think you know obviously it's a it's a process, um, but I think you know. It gives me a lot of comfort that you know these folks are, are in the um, ecosystem really kind of pushing for the same mission so i think overall very um, optimistic about it thank you well thank you all for being here uh, keep doing what you do you know everything that you guys are doing is, is it's all great stuff and you know i am optimistic about the future and what this space looks like in the years to come so um look forward to working with you guys and staying in touch and building that ecosystem that you talked about lydia um take care bye thanks everyone